Okay, uh, just checking, can everyone hear me okay? All right, uh, let's see. All right, well listen, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm gonna do a kind of quick introduction of the rest of the team and then let's move forward and talk about um, Open Crypto Trust. Uh, so um, we have uh, uh, Inkar uh, Yerjanova and uh, hi Inkar. Hello, hi everyone. <laughs> so uh, Inkar is uh, uh, joining us uh, from an operations perspective. Um, and just to give a quick little sense, uh, if you'll forgive the delay, uh, I'm speaking to you today. I'm a, a native New Yorker, so I miss uh, being in New York and even the traffic that you guys are uh, having today. Uh, but uh, I'm speaking to you today from uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan in Central Asia. And uh, so let's see, I know we have uh, Stuart Hall, who's our uh, Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, and Stuart is coming to us from London. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, of course, uh, our CTO, Jeff Doyle, who's in Denver, Colorado. We have uh, our Director of Business Development, uh, who is also our blockchain architect, and that is Mustafa Amin, who is in Egypt, Cairo. Uh, and we have uh, Eric Cavalier, who is leading up our office in Switzerland, uh, but currently he's in Thailand. Uh, he was between Thailand and uh, uh, France. And uh, there's a few more folks. We have Kathy. Uh, Tarkington, our director of PMO. We have Carolyn Barilla, also a uh, business development management. She is in New York. Kathy is in Tennessee. So uh, I know that there might be others that are missing. Lamara, thank you for joining as well. Um, and Lamara is also uh, working with Incar and in operations. Uh, so welcome. Um, so listen. We want to get to the good stuff, and uh, let me try to begin by just talking a little bit about um, our Open Crypto Trust platform. So uh, there's an interesting history, and you know what? I'm just going to share on the screen um, uh, a presentation that might help. Let's see. Give me one second. All righty. So. Um, the Open Crypto Trust platform um, is made up of a number of uh, concepts. It, it was born out of a uh, proof of concept that uh, our team had done uh, four or five years ago um, for Goldman Sachs. Uh, and this was an SDN based uh, uh, project. Um, we were looking at ways to provision optical circuits in a much more efficient uh, way. Um, and so out of that uh, eventually came the idea that uh, uh, by leveraging blockchain um, and certain components, including smart contracts, uh, we'd have the ability to uh, provision not just circuits using SDN, but uh, to actually change the way that circuits are uh, purchased. Um, and that includes providing uh, more or less uh, the ability to uh, allow customers to pay uh, for actual usage, right? So uh, this is something that's uh, very different than what happens now um, in terms of how large scale uh, bandwidth is, uh, is purchased. Uh, it's usually, um, uh, not based on actual usage. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, at uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, for example, where they um, I used to uh, manage their algorithmic trading, um, we would uh, always be looking for circuits with the lowest possible latency. Um, but typically, uh, especially for transoceanic circuits, we would be stuck with uh, two to three year contracts just to kind of get the best possible price that was there. Um, and if we underestimated the amount of bandwidth that we needed, we'd have to provision uh, more circuits that typically took another 60 to 90 days. Um, and so kind of uh, key to some of the uh, solutions that um, uh, we developed is the concept of uh, being able to um, uh, provision on demand 
as well as leveraging uh, certain uh, controlling and smart contract uh, approach to um, uh, billing clients for what they actually use. And so that's uh, kind of the origin of uh, one of the uh, killer applications, the uh, BD-WAN application. Um, but along the way, our development team um, has uh, uh, recognized other ways in which uh, uh, blockchain can be used. I'm going to save for the uh, Q&A portion uh, any questions about um, how blockchain works. Um, or rather, we're going to have uh, uh, an opportunity for um, our team uh, in the form of uh, uh, Jeff Doyle, our CTO, and uh, uh, Mustafa Amin to elaborate a little bit more on the technology and the, uh, the actual killer applications themselves. Um, so, uh, let's uh, talk about, um, I'm going to kind of skip about the history. We'll, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to share that uh, a little bit more uh, at a future time, but there's one other very uh, important component um, that we developed. Um, you know, and one of the things that's uh, so important to share with everyone, and, and I'm so really you know, happy that everyone has joined us today, um, but uh, the power of decentralized networks is uh, a very key component to you know, what we've developed here. And uh, uh, in doing so, we have the need to uh, really support uh, our community, um, uh, the folks who have decided to make the investment in our network uh, and in our platform. And we're going to give a few hints uh, about um, uh, how that's possible and, you know, uh, give some ideas for folks that are unfamiliar with our community uh, exactly how one can participate. Um, Peru, are you there? I, I know you were going to make an announcement, um, but we'll, we'll come back to that, I guess, after I'm done. Um, but uh, so uh, for those who are familiar with the concept of mining, um, you know, we use that word uh, simply to help people to understand what it is. Uh, but from our perspective, it's really um, block producing. Uh, but to support uh, this uh, block production, um, we recognize that, you know, obviously, uh, for those that are familiar with Bitcoin, you know, uh, proof of work is uh, incredibly uh, energy inefficient and uh, um, it has its uh, value in terms of how uh, Bitcoin is supported. Um, the need to ensure that um, uh, because it's public, uh, that no one can um, affect or um, you know, hack the network. Um, but of course, you know, with Ethereum and with other platforms, other blockchain platforms, you have uh, proof of stake, which is great, uh, but uh, in its very nature uh, is somewhat un undemocratic in the sense that it, in it um, uh, someone who has, you know, uh, a larger um, amount of uh, investment in terms of tokens uh, is usually preferred uh, than others. And so while that um, proof of stake does definitely indicate some investment in the platform, there's, it feeds a kind of speculative nature. Um, and so for something that's a little more democratic, uh, we developed uh, what's called proof of duration. And so proof of duration is uh, what allows um, our wide spreading community to be uh, supported even to the extent of someone who's made maybe an investment of just you know a thousand tokens or a hundred tokens, um, based on the amount of time that those tokens have been held, uh, you have an opportunity to be um, uh, rewarded for block production just as someone who maybe has you know ten times the amount of tokens that you have. So it really kind of avoids what we see today, uh, either in uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin, where you have uh, speculative folks that hold a great amount uh, and therefore are uh, rewarded uh, in turn. We wanted to make sure that for even the smallest uh, block producer or investor, uh, that there was um, much more of a commitment and protection of that investment. Um, so I think that 
uh, now might be a good time to talk a little bit more uh, about not just the platform itself. But there's a lot of concepts here that I, I'd like to kind of share. And it's also important for us to know, you know, what it is that our audience is interested in learning more about so that we can, um, you know, tailor the conversation a bit uh, to our group. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to actually uh, turn it over to Mustafa to talk uh, a bit more about uh, uh, blockchain as a transport itself. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mustafa, um, can you take it from here? Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Mandy. Okay, I will go and share my screen now. So can you all see my screen, the presentation? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. So the first, first telco applications we are having all over our open CT or open crypto trust platform is BAT or blockchain as a transport. BAT actually is a leading new technology, you know. It, essentially leverages blockchain to connect layer to island over any kind of available infrastructure, even the public internet. Uh, connecting layer to island, I mean, Ethernet segments, for instance, or switched segments over uh, like uh, another routed infrastructure is not a new technology or a new thing, you know? So we have other technologies that fall under the category of overlay networking technologies that do the same, like VXLAN and VGRE, uh, VTLS and PBB. Each technology has its own pros and cons, you know, and lots of like limitations, lots of working domains. So uh, let's say VXLAN, VXLAN is a brilliant technology. But VXLAN was originally drafted to operate inside a certain domain, data center, cloud, even a private or public cloud. You know? What we are actually doing with BAT is we are integrating blockchain with VXLAN to create a totally new technology that can extend the footprint of VXLAN to traverse the public internet, thus connecting different Ethernet segments or layer two segments across the big global public internet. VXLAN. VXLAN actually is like a, a amazing evolution of VLAN. There are lots of differences between VLAN and VXLAN, but to like name a few, uh, while VLAN with its like 12 bit VLAN ID can like create, you can create up to like uh, 4,000 4, VLANs inside a domain. Why with VXLAN and because it's network identifier, what we call VNI, VNID, we have like 24 bits to identify that. So we can have up to 16 million v, different VXLAN inside a certain domain. Also with VLAN, and if the environment is a flat layer two environment, we need like some kind of layer two technology or protocols like spanning tree protocol that is actually blocking some kind of redundant links in the environment in order to prevent any kind of layer two hard switching loops, you know? But with VXLAN, because it all operates as an overlay over a rooted infrastructure, we don't need to block any kind of redundant links. We can all depend on the routing infrastructure to carry the layer two. So we are making the maximum utilization of our environment and links. As we explained, that is an integration of VXLAN with blockchain. What actually allows us to make use of blockchain in the Telecommunication industry in specific is one of the brilliant feature of blockchain that it is that blockchain can carry or can act as a storage for data or for digital records. So you can store data over blockchain and then you can retrieve 
that uh, piece of data from anywhere where you have the same blockchain running. The other benefits of blockchain, but those are not related to our telecommunication applications, you know, like creating digital assets, any kind of coins, tokens, getting transactions like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, you know, and definitely the smart, smart contract concept that uh, Ethereum represents well. EOS is another platform, Wave is the third one, you know, and lots of others. Okay, so let's see how we, uh, like, we will integrate or leverage blockchain with VXLAN. VXLAN in its original draft was created to operate inside a, a single domain or an environment where multicast should be enabled, you know? So, with the multicast enabled infrastructure, the different VTEX, or what we call VXLAN tunnel endpoints, like LEAF1, LEAF2, and LEAF3 in this example, can use some kind of like special technique called flood and learn in order to learn the different MAC addresses for the different uh, like nodes, server, virtual machines, storage devices, whatever. No? So in our case, Server 1 and Server 2 are inside the same VLAN ID 123. And because we are using VXLAN, they are in the same VXLAN with ID or VNI, VNI 10 1 to 3. So when Server 1 wants to communicate initially with Server 2, it will send, it, it knows Server 2 IP address, but it doesn't know Server 2 MAC address. And it needs the MAC address because, again, it is a layer two communication. So it will broadcast an ARP request packet. LEAF1 will encapsulate that ARP request in a VXLAN packet, and it will add a very specific multicast address from the multicast group address for that VNI 10, 1, 2, 3. So each VNI or VXLAN identifier has its own corresponding multicast group address. Then LEAF2 and all other VTAPs participating in the same VNI will receive the multicast packet. And LEAF2, when it receives the VXLAN encapsulated packet, it will decapsulate the packet and it will send the ARP request to server 2. Server 2 will recognize it. We recognize that it is like directed to itself, so it will reply with an ARP reply unicast to server one. LEAF2 will take the ARP reply, will encapsulate the message in a VXLAN message, and but this time it will not use multicast, it will use the unicast IP address of LEAF1 because LEAF2 already learned that that the ARP re uh, request was coming from LEAF1. At this stage, we achieve what we call the flood and learn. So all LEAFs in our case, or all VTAPs in the VXLAN domain, will be able to have a updated MAC to VTAP mapping entries in their memory. So if any unicast packet is coming from any server or any virtual machine to the other, the VXLAN encapsulation will be used with the remote VTAP that the destination virtual machine or server is connected to. For multicast and broadcast, VXLAN uses a very special technique called head-end replication. But in, in, like in the majority of data center, we can have, or public or private cloud, we can have multicast enabled always, you know? So what if, uh, or what will be the case with VXLAN uh, without multicast. Again, in this mode of operation, we call it control plane less unicast VXLAN. And in order for the VXLAN to operate properly without multicast being enabled in the infrastructure, all VTAPs or all leads in our example here, LIF1, LIF2, and LIF3, needs to be configured manually with the other, with a list of all other VTAPs existing in that domain. 
And the same procedure will happen. I mean, the flood and learn technique for the different VTEPs to populate their MAC to VTEP hard entries. Vendors, some vendors started to realize that this kind of control plus kind of operation is not like the uh, best thing ever, you know? So they started like Cisco, Juniper, and, and VMware, they started to um, create some kind, of, some kind of control plane or to add some kind of control plane components to VXLAN. So because SDN is very popular and was very popular, was very pop popular at the time, so some vendors decided that it's time to use, to make use of the SDN controller to carry and to send and update all VTEPs in that VXLAN domain with the needed MAC to VTEP mapping entries. So we don't need multicast to be enabled in the infrastructure, and we don't need to configure the different VTEPs uh, or devices manually with the different like lists or VTEP lists or any kind of MAC to VTEP mapping entry, you know? So let's say leaf one will know the MAC address of server one, and it, it will send that kind of information to the uh, SDN controller that in turn will populate all the uh, like MAC to VTEP tap mapping entries in all other VTEPs. So we are making use of the SDN controller to uh, participate as a control or signaling plane component. Adding a control plane could also be achieved via the well-known multi-protocol BGP that all people were using for the layer 2 VPN MPLS, layer 3 VPN MPLS. So multi-protocol BGP can not only carry layer 3 IPv4 or uh, routing information or layer 3 IPv6, but it can also carry MAC addresses as the uh, information between the different nodes running multi-protocol BGP. So in this case, we are making use of multi-protocol BGP, what we call EVP and VXLAN to, to uh, like act as the control plane component for that kind of VXLAN. What we are actually doing now after all this introduction is we are making use of blockchain and in specific our OpenCT platform that is a hybrid based blockchain to act as the control plane component for a VXLAN. That way, and because blockchain actually, or normally is like global, public, it's distributed, it's like it, it could span the, like, the whole world, you know, we can make use of that to extend the footprint or working domain of VXLAN to include the public internet, you know? So it's exactly as it as appearing here in this slide, you know? So you can have a site maybe in the US, you can have a site anywhere in Asia or Africa or Europe, and we, you can make use with that. It utilizes the public internet to connect both sites, I mean both three or two sites, over the internet with VXLAN and with blockchain, meaning with BAT. Initially, once like the, uh, the operation starts, the VTEPs, actually all VTEPs in BAT will require to have, or will be required to have a blockchain software component running over the different boxes and networking gear. That is, or that will be our OpenCT blockchain. So initially, each VTEP knows only about its local like nodes, server, virtual machine, storage, you know? But once you have the blockchain app running and the information is exchanged properly over blockchain, we can reach the final state where every VTEP will know not only about its locally connected nodes, but also about the MAC address of the different nodes and most importantly, the MAC to VTEP information. So if VTEP one, needs or if server one needs to communicate to server four, VTEP one will know that it needs to send a VXLAN packet across the internet 
to the destination IP address of VT4 that will then decapsulate the VXM packet and send the unicast packet directly to server 4. So layer 2 connectivity is, ach is achieved across the public internet. So we talked about the data storage and the retriever over blockchain. Actually, it is the data is exchanged over blockchain and as let's say a stream of hexadecimal data, you know, you can we can use any kind of like online hexadecimal to text converter to convert a stream of hexadecimal records to the appropriate or proper text. So the above stream could be translated to customer 155 VNID 10 400, you know. We can send that other stream, meaning customer, the same customer, customer 155, VNID 12500, you know. So it is not actually in reality or in practice, it is not that simple and easy because we cannot only send plain and simple hexadecimal data. We will be adding lots of encryption to the data. So if any kind of blockchain node intercepts the stream, it will understand nothing from it actually. And remember, we are only talking about the control and signaling component of the VX plan or of that. We are not talking about actual data plane because the data plane activity or real traffic will be carried across the internet as usual, as normal, encapsulated in VX plan packets. That is a real uh, like screenshot from a blockchain where we are publishing a stream of data and for that specific stream of data it means a, a very complex thing like customer 100 1555 uh, um, uh, uh, vnid 10123 mac address of, okay, and vita of the ip address you know so we can carry very complex complex messages as data carried over blockchain that way we can allow the different signaling and control play uh, control uh, kind of transactions and data exchange between the different nodes thus allowing that to operate properly quickly what the very proposition of that that is an appealing when option in front of traditional when technologies like vpn like uh, the very expensive mtls over dedicated links, you know, because it only makes uh, use, uh, it only makes use of the public internet. That is a very advanced layer to VPN, so we can compare it to very, like, uh, complex SD-WAN architecture. And with BD-WAN, you will see that we are also targeting the SD-WAN solution. Uh, we can allow that to be to operate either virtually, so you can add the software component only to your networking gear, or we can like uh, offer the full end-to-end -end solution, meaning software and hardware. Hmm? And because it's some kind of tunneling, it's a multi-point tunneling technique. It's not a point-to-point -point tunneling, and that's most important because of the scalability needed in that design that can transport any kind of like uh, uh, of, of traffic over the public internet and because always the map to vtap mapping entries are always being populated and updated uh, over the uh, the internet so there will not be any kind of like unknown unicast kind of traffic last but not least that can carry unicast, can carry multicast, can carry broadcast. Thus, it's an appealing layer to transport service, especially for those businesses like um, uh, requiring very critical, sensitive, high frequency like trading applications, like all kinds of fintech companies and organizations. Thank you. Jeff. Can you please take it? Great. Um, and Thanks so much. <clears throat> Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Um, hi. Hopefully, I'm uh, unmuted here, and um, I'm going to um, 
um, be talking a little bit about about an extension. Sorry, I was I got myself a little bit distracted there, but I'm going to be talking about um, an extension of, of of blockchain applied specifically to a technology that is already out there and very popular uh, called SD WAN, uh, software defined. Uh, wide area networking and our extension is blockchain to find wide area networking to really understand what that is we have to start off by uh, understanding what SD-WAN is and very briefly what SD-WAN does is um, it's it's a uh, an application of software defined networking um, SDN and uh, it is based on experience long experience using um, SDN in the data center to virtualize the infrastructure there. Um, and we've taken that experience, or SD-WAN has taken that experience and applied it to the wide area network. Uh, so I'm going to share a, a few slides here. Um, let's see, Get my, uh, share my screen here. There we go. All right, um, that should be up. Yeah, I can see that now. Um, so to understand where SD-WAN begins, um, traditionally um, companies, especially companies that have a tremendous number of branch offices struggle a lot with the kind of WAN technologies to be used at those branch offices. The example I've shown here, we've got a corporate office that has a couple of uh, data centers and they've got uh, a lot of branch offices. This is probably a financial institution or a retail inst uh, institution. I can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But as you can see, there's kind of a menu of, uh, of different wide area networking uh, options there. Typically, what happens at branch offices is companies will connect to a, a rather expensive uh, MPLS, multi-protocol label switching uh, cloud, uh, that's that's provided by some local provider or uh, a internet a national or international carrier, um, and they're paying premium dollars for that MPLS service. And they'll be using public internet, maybe for a backup, maybe for some of their less uh, important traffic, but then there's also other options they could have out there like Metro, metro Ethernet, wireless, and so forth. Um, the point out of all of this, the challenges for, um, for uh, companies is, is that they have a lot of CapEx problems around this. NPLS, as I mentioned, is very expensive. Routers at each site and firewalls at each site are very expensive. And having somebody actually go to the site to do maintenance on those devices or install those devices, um, upgrade them as necessary is also expensive. There's also uh, OPEX problems around that, which really in a nutshell, I've got uh, several bullets there, but in a nutshell, it, it amounts to that managing uh, day to day, this kind of a network and managing change control and so forth is uh, is quite a challenge. And then finally, just service problems. Um, this kind of network can have kind of lousy uh, analytics. And how do I really tell, how to en engineer my network, what traffic goes where and so forth, um, uh, based on poor analytics. Um, so the solution for software-defined wide area networking is to basically um, aggregate all of the WAN, make it appear at each site as just a cloud. And there's various services within that cloud. Uh, so we still have, you know, the separate MPLS, public internet, dedicated services and so forth, but we're virtualizing all of that uh, infrastructure, just like we would virtualize the infrastructure in a data center. Uh, but now we're extending this out to the wide area networking and we control the entire thing with um, an SDN controller, in this particular case, an SD-WAN uh, controller. So this enables a single point of glass 
uh, view into the network. Uh, we're able to centralize our policies, centralize our configuration control. Uh, we eliminate the need for site-by-site -site policy configuration. We eliminate the need for actually having someone go out uh, and physically change or reconfigure or, uh, or upgrade uh, devices at each site. And we have much better visibility into the traffic that's going through our network so we can make better choices about what traffic goes over our expensive MPLS network as opposed to uh, inexpensive public internet and so forth. And we can also monitor uh, just what the performance is of that traffic. And I mentioned that, um, that SD-WAN is particularly popular with uh, financial and retail in, uh, verticals primarily because of the number of branch offices they have out there. And you can see a, uh, down in the corner a bit of a quote from, uh, from Gartner about that. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these bullet points. Uh, this is actually from another presentation. But I did want to just hit very quickly on things I haven't said yet or just reemphasize some things I said. Uh, that SD-WAN has some tremendous benefits uh, for the for the individual enterprise user uh, in terms of uh, zero touch provisioning, basically, uh, rather than having someone go out and configure a router and firewall and all of that, uh, you can just uh, send uh, simple, inexpensive gear to the site, um, have someone locally plug it in to uh, uh, to the WAN, and then remotely bring everything up and configure it properly. So uh, you have less truck rolls. Uh, less operational complexity and much cheaper components. Uh, for our service providers, uh, they're very interested in this too. You'll hear service providers talk a lot about cloudification of their network. And what they're really saying is, is that they're uh, virtualizing their infrastructure and they're looking at, at uh, um, SD-WAN as a new way of creating revenue, a new way of creating services, there's benefit for the end user around this of having a service provider even take over uh, the complexity, uh, uh, the lesser complexity of SD-WAN. So uh, they can create managed services, cloud integration and so forth. And there's already strong adoption within service providers uh, for SD-WAN technologies and they're partnering with different SD-WAN startups. Uh, just, I've got some examples there. CenturyLink actually uses Versa for their uh, uh, for their service, their SD-WAN service. AT&T uses VeloCloud. Uh, Verizon uses Viptela, which is now part of Cisco. Uh, GTT also uses uh, VeloCloud. Um, how important is SD-WAN? Well, uh, right now there's there's a lot of projections, um, and I've put a few quotes in here around market projections for SD-WAN. But uh, you can see that over uh, three to five years, in general, the projections are saying that this is quickly going to become uh, an eight to nine billion dollar uh, business, just SD-WAN. Um, and if you, if you look up SD-WAN vendors, if you do a Google search on that, you'll see that there's a couple of dozen vendors out there, which really reflects the fact uh, that this is a very successful technology People are using it now. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are very definite business benefits um, to deploying SD, uh, SD-WAN now, as opposed to some of the technologies you see around uh, SDN in the data center where, where uh, um, enterprises are sometimes saying, yeah, that's really interesting and we recognize where this might go, but we're going to wait around SDM. That's not the case with SD-WAN. Um, so that sets the stage. Um, there are, nevertheless, some concerns that a lot of enterprises uh, and the industry in general has expressed around uh, SD-WAN. At the top is security. How secure is, the, uh, is, uh, is a network where we have a controller or maybe a cluster of controllers um, and our entire uh, WAN infrastructure is uh, dependent on that controller being safe and secure and the control messages that those controllers are sending out have to be safe and secure and can't be corrupted. 
Uh, there's concerns around vendor diversity and architectural diversity. I don't go into it uh, here because just because of limits of time, but there's a lot of different SD-WAN architectures that we could be using. Um, and how do we consolidate that and decide what is best for the end user? The other part that's important to know is, is, is that with most SD-WAN services now, you get a flat fee monthly billing. Um, and um, um, and uh, um, so you're paying for that, whether you pay for the service or not. Um, and there's less than dynamic deployment of new services. So this is where BD-WAN comes in. Uh, BD-WAN is blockchain defined wide area networks. And really it's just a token based approach uh, to orchestrating SD-WAN. Um, and the result of that is being able to, uh, to uh, have uh, much higher security, much more flexibility and so forth. Um, around your SD-WAN service. Um, the on-premise units uh, for SD-WAN or BD-WAN in this case use crypto tokens uh, to basically, to, to virtually pay for the services they use. And that means you can unlock services quickly, uh, you can uh, de-deploy, and maybe I just made up that word, but you can de-deploy services very quickly. Um, um, as you need them. And uh, more than that, you can pay as you go uh, with these services. Uh, components of BD-WAN, I'm just going to go very, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, recap that quickly, but basically you have a controller just like SD-WAN. You have individual units at uh, premises, the, the CPEs, and behind that is the global blockchain based on the open uh, crypto trust platform uh, that connects the controller and units uh, to the OpenCT blockchain, and then you have the BD-WAN secure cloud itself. Um, so, benefits of BD-WAN, uh, you have trusted per usage billing um, um, that can be verified, and of course it's hard-coded because it is blockchain, um, that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. Uh, you pay only for what you consume, um, and you, you can do uh, on-demand deployment and, um, and uh, withdrawal of services as you need them. You can unlock new services on the fly. You can integrate with legacy technologies, um, which give you, gives you um, uh, a lot of creativity around your WAN uh, virtualized infrastructure. Um, you have full visibility over all of your transport facilities, which means, again, you can apply better analytics and make better decisions about how your traffic is treated across your wide area network. Uh, you can be, especially for service providers, you can uh, bring your public cloud services and content services singly to your customers. And I put it in red because it's so important. Uh, you have a fully secure and immutable control. In other words, you can't modify the control and record of your WAN ecosystem. Um, and so that is uh, BD WAN in a, in a nutshell. And um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen there. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to, um, um, to Mustafa, who's going to talk a bit about uh, tokenomics. You know what? Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. That was awesome. Uh, really appreciate it. Before we get into the tokenomics, um, I'm going to ask if we can get Peru to come back to talk uh, a little bit about an announcement for the folks that are uh, patiently listening. Um, I'm excited to get to the Q&A to address any questions that folks may have, uh, but I think it would be very helpful uh, to you know, change the agenda just ever so slightly. So, Peru, uh, after you're done, if you can turn it back to Mustafa, who will talk about the tokenomics, but um, Peru, uh, I think you have an announcement you want to share. We mentioned that we're going to be giving token giveaway today. So we decided to give each and every one of you 20 tokens. And as far as the webinar participants, they're getting 10 tokens each. So thank you. It's our appreciation to you.
Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, this is a great opportunity to now uh, listen uh, and learn about the tokenomics behind uh, uh, our OCT uh, platform. Uh, Mustafa, take it away. Yep, sure. I'll show my screen. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Tokenomics or token economics. Fine. So, the token allocation for our OCT, and by the way, our token is named OCT, stands for Open Crypto Trust. So the pl platform itself is OpenCT, and that token is OCT. We have four main categories for the token allocation. One is the pre-token crowd sale, that is the phase we are currently in. And in this phase, we are like uh, offering 10% of the maximum token supply to be like uh, available for uh, investors. During the token crowd sale that will take place from the 2nd of April to the 2nd of May, uh, we are offering 40% of the maximum token supply. The reserve, and we will see two seconds, the uh, like reserve different categories, it will represent 35% of the maximum token supply. The minor reward, our platform has a very unique, brilliant minor reward, and that will represent 15% of the maximum token supply. And by the way, the maximum, our maximum token supply for OCT token is 250 million tokens. That's it. No more, no less. Okay, so pre-token crowd sale 10% is 25 million. Token crowd sale 40% is 100 million. Reserve 35% is 87.5 million. And minor reward 15 is 37.5 million tokens. Okay. For the token crowd sale activities, I mean both pre-token crowd sale and token crowd sale, our OCT token will be based over the Ethereum blockchain for the only purpose of raising funds via uh, offering the token, the OCT token, to be like um, uh, to be like uh, acquired or bought by the different investors. Uh, so, because it is over the Ethereum blockchain, it follows the standard of the ERC20 token over the Ethereum blockchain. And we are going to have two different smart contracts. One smart contract for the pre-token crowd sale and another one for the token crowd sale. The OCT token, before we have our platform up and running, I mean, during the token crowd sale activity, will be named OCTB or OCT before platform. Anyone can participate via fiat money, I mean regular money, US dollar, sterling pound, euros, via debit or credit card, PayPal, wire transfer over our website, as well as different crypto uh, currencies, mainly Bitcoin and Ethereum. And most probably we are, we are gonna uh, allow other kind of uh, others, uh, other cryptocurrencies. I mean, OCT B token will be mapped to the utility OCT token once the OpenCT platform is up and running in few months after the conclusion of the ICO, and the mapping will be in a one to one ratio. So if someone holds like million OCT B token, he or she will get million OCT token once the platform is up. The smart contracts we are using over Ethereum actually are tied to a multi-signature wallet that require the signature of three members of the executive board of uh, OpenCT company that gives the maximum protection and like care for our investors' money. And we are gonna burn the unsold token during the crowd sale activity. Okay, so 
Let's now talk, talk about the pre-talking crowd phase. It is the current phase we are currently in. We are offering 25 million OCT B token with a fixed price of 75 cents per token or its equivalent in Ethereum. Uh, we have some kind of private deals for investors uh, looking to uh, acquire 15, 20, or above 20 over the, uh, from the uh, like, uh, uh, share allocated for the pre-token crowd sale, but they will not be able to take full control over their tokens because we would like to protect other investors, our other regular investors, you know? We cannot allow someone to like invest with us and hold 5 million tokens. And once our token hits the exchange in a month after the conclusion of our, of our token crowd sale, we cannot like accept that the token or the 5 million tokens will be sold at once because of the supply and demand rule, the price will decrease. And we would like to protect the other investors' investments. That's why we are holding or visiting the big whales uh, share logged to be logged inside the smart contract for periods that vary from two years to three years. So the second phase is the token crowd sale. During the token crowd sale, 100 million tokens will be available for investors. And is there any kind of discount? No, because actually the discount is included or built in in a very, very unique and special function we are using for our token price during the crowd phase. We are using a linear function where the price of the first token will start with 93 cents and the price for the last token the 100 million token will be 1.31 US dollar. There is no minimum, and no maximum purchase amount. That is the linear function. So you can see that the price of the first token is 92 cents. The price for the last token is 1.31 US dollar. And every token price is above the previous one. So if someone would like to acquire 10 tokens, he or she will be getting the 10 tokens with 10 different prices. That is the idea of the linear function. And because it's a linear function, and for those of you who don't like math, it is always like uh, the, to decide about the amount of tokens uh, acquired by a special investor, we have to solve the area or to calculate the area under the graph. But don't worry, no user or no investor and even no one will be required to do the math in any kind of differentiation and integration, integral functions, because the smart contract will be doing that on its own automatically. And that's the beauty of the programming. Reserve. We have three main categories or areas for uh, reserve tokens. 50% of the reserve or 43.75 million tokens will go to the company. And because again, we would like to protect our investors' investments, we cannot get full control of those tokens directly and immediately. So those tokens will be logged in the smart contract and will be released by 25% every six months over a two year period. Those, the reserve amount for company will be used for different purposes. You know? So the funds we are gonna raise from the pre-token crowd sale and token crowd sale uh, will be used to fully establish the company, fully develop the platform along with its telco killer app we talked about, Bet and BDON and all other kind of like blockchain and solutions for the platform to be fully up and running in a few months 
after the conclusion of the crowd trade. But for the reserved amount of token, those will be used in a very special areas, like any kind of MAs, any kind of like IP uh, publications, any extra development and marketing activity needed for like uh, other verticals or other industries that we are going to leverage our open city uh, for. Uh, not not only for the telecommunication industry, but we have plans like to go for the uh, financial, energy, supply chain, healthcare, mm -hmm. and for BDON solution in specific that Jeff explained perfectly. You know, we are gonna make use of the company reserve to establish any kind of partnership agreement with those telco service provider and telco operators around the globe to be able to offer the BDON solution seamlessly and transparently from each city in the world. The second area for the reserve will be for the team. For us, as if we represent 26.25 million tokens, again, we will not take full control of the token. It will be like vested in a smart contract for two years. Last area of the token reserve is bounty. 17.5 million tokens will be used for bounty campaign. Like airdrops tokens, we are gonna send few OCTB tokens over the Ethereum blockchain to random users. And for our Bitcoin talk forum signature campaign and marketing activity, translation services, any area where we can use bounty tokens for. Last but not least, the minor reward. Okay, so who are the ones who are like eligible to mine or produce blocks over our OpenCT platform? As Mayandi explained, we have two kinds of algorithm or mining algorithm over our OpenCT platform. One is proof of stake or some kind of variation of proof of stake called DPoS or delegated proof of stake that will allow the uh, like top shareholders to be eligible to produce more blocks to verify data carried over the blockchain to verify transactions and so on and getting reward for their efforts. And because our mining algorithm is very democratic, we are also gonna allow people holding low amount of our token, but keeping those low amounts in their wallet for long periods of time to be also eligible to become block producers and hence getting minor rewards. That's like a graph. For our minor rewards, it's very unique, you know. We are having minor rewards like over five years, you know. We are using a very mathematical formula of one like brilliant scientist called Jacob Bernoulli, you know, where every year the amount of tokens available for mining activities decrease, you know, so the amount of minor reward token decreases year over year. And we are offering also some kind of annual profits for over and above the uh, fixed uh, number of tokens per year. Not to calculate or not to confuse you much with all kind of like very hard and like tough calculations, we use Jacob Bernoulli to make sure that if we are gonna distribute mining rewards every like nanoseconds, it will not exceed the maximum number of tokens over the five years. That's the number shown in red. And, and please, please read about that brilliant Bernoulli function and read all about our, about our calculation and math in order to reach that reward architecture. And we are always here to answer any kind of question. 
I will leave the math, not to add any kind of confusion. But again, please take a look at it and let us know if you have any questions with it. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Mustafa. That was great. <clears throat> and, uh, um, you know, for the folks that are hearing all of this for the very first time, uh, obviously there's a lot to digest. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to hopefully having a healthy Q&A. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to ask questions. It doesn't matter how complex and it doesn't matter how simple. I promise you our team will answer. Um, and if for some reason it's something that's so complex that uh, we're afraid we're going to lose most of the audience, uh, you know, we do have regularly scheduled webinars um, on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, and uh, you're more than welcome to attend. But let's get to the Q&A. And so um, we have some questions on the webinar, which we're answering in real time, and I'll share them. But let's uh, go to the real audience there. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to you, Peru. Um, can you uh, uh, please, uh, uh, between you and John, can we handle the uh, uh, live yes, Q&A? Sir. Certainly. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 it's in gate. Hold on one second. Here, you go. Okay. Okay. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, I just had a question about the, um, uh, you know, registration or current regulatory, you know, situation. Or can you just tell us kind of how you guys are, you know, what your certifications are or what, you know, what we might face given the SEC press right now? Yes. Um, let me uh, uh, attempt to answer that. So, uh, you know, one of the things that was very important to us is to ensure that, you know, what we offer, both our platform, our solutions, and the tech of itself, our uh, SEC, under SEC and FINMA uh, regulations. Um, FINMA, because we, uh, this project, this platform is actually based in Zug, Switzerland. Um, and that's really not having anything to do with regulatory concerns, just as much as that in Switzerland, there's a community that's a lot more embracing of uh, the kind of solutions that we're seeking to offer. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, SEC regulations in the United States, um, we are following a, a Reg D uh, against 506C, uh, which simply means that we are compliant in the sense that uh, for those that are going to be investing when we are doing the token sale, which begins April 1st, um, we will only be accepting investment from accredited investors. Um, and so one of the cool things is that we have this partnership with a, a Silicon Valley based company by the name of Identity Mind. Um, and they have a database of about 500 million globally uh, 500 million um, uh, e-commerce and investor uh, folks. Uh, they've been doing an amazing job of supporting other ICOs as well. Uh, but through this uh, collaboration, when uh, folks come to our website and register and uh, participate, um, we're, very, we're able to very quickly, in a streamlined fashion, uh, confirm uh, whether or not they're accredited, follow up if there's additional documentation that's necessary, uh, but we're very pleased with this uh, collaborative relationship with Identity Mind. Um, so uh, uh, I hope that answers your question in terms of you know regulatory concerns. And one more comment on that: just that um, you know, uh, folks in the ICO community uh, belabor this question a lot, and there's a lot of comments about it. But at the end of the day, you know, the reason for uh, those regulatory concerns is quite simply to protect investors and to make sure that um, uh, the folks that uh, invest uh, have some uh, form of protection and that you know, um, they're not being uh, taken advantage of. So we're very you know, welcoming of this uh, regulatory uh, trend and I think it actually goes a long way to uh, establishing uh, the ICO model as something that's worthy uh, and real. Um, you know, so there's lots of questions about, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency market and ICOs, and uh, I'm happy to answer any of them. I've, I've, I'm someone who went from a rather skeptical um, 
uh, sense of them. Uh, back in 2009, I was working at uh, Morgan Stanley when you know Bitcoin first became a thing. Um, and uh, I've, I've come to embrace it and to really understand the importance of this uh, uh, decentralized uh, infrastructure, community, and so forth. And I'm a huge advocate now, obviously. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question. Hello, I, I was very blown away by most of this. I've worked in the telecom space, mm -hmm. uh, going back to prepaid phone cards. Uh, I know a little bit about fiber, but if I understand part of your special sauce, mm -hmm. it's you're creating a, a, a virtual control plane in a way so that you can ride over any of the networks, it becomes agnostic. And that having been said, I see that part of the reserve will nonetheless, and I think I understand this, put towards leveraging and securing local access, right? Dedicated lines like Con Ed in New York, right? I used to work at Telex down on 60 Hudson. Yes. Of course. Been there so many, you're doing some, and that's nice. just your backbone, so then you can, but my, my real my question is, and it would take three days for me to even process this, do you have a pricing model? I, I, I think you do. It's buried somewhere. I am two weeks into tokens. But are you <laughs> telling me Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and all these retails will pay in the, quote, currency of tokens? Okay. Uh, let me take this because it's a very good uh, uh, and intelligent question. And again, you know, our best participants are folks that are educated uh, and understand uh, exactly what it is. And so I always get excited. Uh, before I get directly to your question, I want to also just mention that, you know, one of the things that's wonderful about what we're doing is that uh, we definitely see ourselves as something of a bridge. Uh, for folks in telecommunications to better understand uh, what's happening in the world of blockchain, right? So, uh, you know, thank you for your question. Um, so we gave a lot of thought uh, as to how we were going to uh, bring our solutions and services to market. And uh, uh, the way that it will be done is through partnerships with uh, telco uh, companies. Um, and we're very humbled and excited by the uh, 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 expressions of interest from uh, many uh, telco organizations uh, globally. Um, Deutsche Telekom uh, uh, is uh, one to mention and, and others as well. But um, what uh, you asked is, you know, how are the enterprise uh, end clients going to actually pay for the services? So what we designed is something unique that um, if you understand how tokens work um, within the blockchain, uh, they're a very necessary element. And in fact, you know, our utility-based token is actually, um, you know, it's the gas that fuels uh, the services, right? So the tokens are necessary in order to unlock the services uh, within our network. So the nodes within the network, the controllers, all need tokens in order to function. Um, and so from the end client's perspective, while we may be offering discounts for folks that are willing to pay using tokens, we also, as much as we're ready to revolutionize the world of uh, uh, telecommunications, we wanted this to be something that uh, would be very easy for end clients to adopt. So we're not, in fact, uh, uh, insisting that people pay with tokens. Um, while it may be an option and while there'll be incentives for people to use tokens, at the end of the day, they're going to receive a, a bill uh, very much like they're used to. Um, obviously, you know, with better service, uh, cheaper, you know, cheaper service, cheaper cost for the same service, uh, and more efficiently uh, monitored and reported upon. Uh, but they'll be paying with traditional fiat, meaning that they'll receive a bill, they'll pay their for their bandwidth in you know, dollars, uh, euros, uh, whatever uh, denomination is uh, local to them, uh, or you know, uh, credit cards, et cetera. So I hope that answers your question. Um, 
Uh, and uh, uh, again, we're very excited about the thought and approach that we've put into it. A lot of uh, care and detail has gone into it. Um, next question or follow up if there is. Knowing that uh, the services are going to be faster than anything that's out there, what are you guys going to do um, security-wise? Like, knowing that a lot of things, you know, they might have, like, faster speeds. They might, you know, develop, you know, problems, you know, when it comes to security and things like that. Like, what are you guys going to do or what is already in place? That's an excellent question. I'm going to ask uh, perhaps Mustafa to address uh, security concerns. Uh, Mustafa? Yes, sure. So, uh, we are actually having lots of plans for security. I mean, lots of like security layers will be added to the solution, you know. So, for BATS, for blockchain as a transport, we are going to encrypt all kind of like data carried over the blockchain. That is one. Two, actually, because it is over blockchain, you know, so there is like, uh, there's actually no probability at all of any like kind of intercepting nodes to be added to the blockchain to act as a VTAP, unlike the original draft for VX plan, because it was uh, or it is uh, sorry, it was drafted to operate over a multicast enabled infrastructure. You know, so once anyone can get gain access to the infrastructure they can like put some kind of device that will pretend to act as a one of the VTAP, thus intercepting all kind of traffic and getting and learning about all kind of MAC addresses and traffic here and there. But with blockchain added to the VTAP, VTAPs, no uh, like intermediary points or nodes could be added without being verified and secured over the blockchain. That is one of the like good features and benefits of our blockchain you know so we are adding different layers of security for bd it's way above the security of the sd because again it's over blockchain so as jeff explained it is blockchain that will carry all kind of transactions and communications between the bd controller and the bd units you know so because it's over blockchain no kind of security holds will be there. No one can get a BDON or an SDON unit normally and try to uh, like get or redirect the traffic or like uh, inject any kind of fake routing control or information in order to attract sensitive kind of traffic. No one can do that because again, it's over blockchain. So if a unit is to be added, it will not be verified by the blockchain so the access will be denied. Awesome, that's great. Um, well, we definitely have you know, uh, questions from the webinar that I'd like to, uh, from the folks that are participating by the webinar, uh, and I'd like to in fact share it with the wider audience. Um, let's you know, continue to get uh, uh, questions from the audience. Um, with the webinar questions, we're gonna be texting folks and answering them directly. So if you haven't gotten an answer yet, an answer is on its way. Uh, so, uh, John or Peru, uh, do we have more questions from the audience? Yes, uh, infrastructure is rarely sexy, just ask the U.S. government. Um, that said, what is your competition in post-ICO, what is your dev time to market? Okay, awesome questions, uh, and uh, very funny. So, um, one of the cool things about uh, our approach to doing this is that we are very uh, uh, close to bringing our products to market. Uh, we're doing um, in the process of uh, uh, in various stages of demos uh, of the uh, 
uh, MVP, minimal viable product. Um, but uh, you asked about competition and uh, you know, it's funny, uh, a lot of folks that I would uh, imagine to be competition um, have actually uh, reached out to us and asked us to collaborate with them, <laughs> which is very uh, exciting. And, and in fact, you know, when we came up with our platform model for delivery was through collaboration and through partnerships. So we're very excited about that. Um, as far as competition, quite honestly, you know, without uh, 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 putting myself in a, uh, a situation where uh, I'll discover that someone uh, remotely is working on this in some way, uh, the reality is that we are, uh, I would say, first to market with regard to these solutions specifically. Uh, there is no one that has focused on enterprise telecommunications uh, and leveraging blockchain in order to do that. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen, uh, certainly our folks in the mobile space, um, uh, mobile wireless space that have attempted to leverage blockchain to uh, deliver uh, uh, you know, tel uh, cell phone uh, contracts in an effective way. Uh, there's things that relate to storage, of course, um, leveraging blockchain, uh, but to deliver, you know, true telecommunications bandwidth based solutions, uh, there is no one that's doing that today. Um, and I can say with a great deal of confidence, uh, because we've been working on this in some form uh, over the last four or five years, um, we have some of the you know, top uh, developers working on this, um, led by, you know, uh, Mustafa Amin and our CTO Jeff Doyle um, and uh, you know for folks that uh, may hear about what we're doing and, and want to uh, step up the competition we welcome it um, I think very uh, positively we're uh, at least uh, uh, several years ahead of uh, anyone that uh, decides they would like to play in this area um, I hope I answered your question uh, you wanted to know how quickly we could be uh, to market. Um, and, you know, we're looking at the completion of the ICO to be delivering our solutions uh, in various forms through our partnerships in, I'd say, 60 to 90 days. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, is there a, um, in, in that process, is there a, a lead in terms of a mobile operator that you're working with um, in terms of, you know, going to market first with? And then my second question is, what trading platform will the tokens trade on? Awesome. Let me answer the second question first, because it's a little bit uh, easier. So um, we are going to be making announcements um, even prior to the close of the ICO uh, as to which exchanges uh, uh, our tokens will be available for trading. Uh, but we fully intend to leverage uh, most of the well-known or I'll say, you know, top five uh, exchanges. Um, and so those announcements are, are going to be made um, in good time and shared with everyone. Um, mobile carrier partnerships. So um, while we're talking to lots of different uh, 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 telco uh, entities, uh, in the mobile space in particular, um, we don't have, uh, I'll say, uh, we're not ready to announce um, um, in respect to uh, some of the folks who've already reached out to us, we're not quite ready to announce um, a partnership in the mobile space. Uh, but, you know, we are definitely in talks with um, uh, some global carriers, uh, not U.S.-based uh, for the mobile space, but uh, we're definitely in talks with some. Uh, I wish I could be less cryptic, but uh, we'll save that for a future announcement. I have to disclose one point. I, I, I'm a seasoned securities lawyer. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, and I know in looking at exchanges, there's, going to be, there's about to be a sea change in which they will all embrace, embrace, the ACE, embrace the SEC and become automated trading platforms. It's happening, okay. Uh, but my question is, are you offering your 
assets, we won't call them securities, uh, globally. Uh, and in the U.S., it's only to the Reg D big boys. Is that, that correct? And that's during your pre-platform and post-platform, because I saw the word crowd sale up there, and I thought, without getting technical, of something that's available to me and I'll, many. Yeah. So, you know, we have sought um, uh, advice from uh, the services of, uh, you know, various law firms uh, who have this specialty, much like you do. Um, and we have chosen um, uh, to handle this question in a couple of ways. So, yes, we are accepting participation globally. Um, and there's a fine line uh, between what is um, uh, in the private as well as the public pre-token sale uh, before we, um, you know, our formal ICO. Uh, there's a fine line uh, about uh, the level of participation that's accepted, uh, but we go through uh, extreme vetting and a sort of whitelisting process for those that uh, choose to participate now. Um, and uh, so in answer to your question, uh, during the ICO itself, during the uh, uh, public uh, token sale, uh, we are uh, only accepting in the United States uh, accredited investors uh, that, you know, uh, uh, within line with the Reg D uh, filing. Um, if there's a follow-up to that, I'm happy to... Uh... Yeah, again, that, that last question was a personal question because your okay. answer is, oh, shucks, I can't, I can't participate, yeah. and I'd love to. I'm not there yet. But okay. uh, if, if you would describe to us, for all of us, uh, what are the three top risk factors? Mm -hmm. You know, where can this go pear-shaped? Mm -hmm. you know, okay. Uh, uh, so... Let me address that in a... In, in and you can say it can't. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Well, um, so uh, I hope that I answered also earlier uh, for you directly. So, you know, um, let, me, let me address it this way. Uh, in order to offset risk, uh, we've rather brilliantly... Uh, within our smart contract, um, provide uh, a certain level of protection for investors. So, number one, um, our uh, smart contract, which is being audited right now, in fact, uh, is going to be made available uh, even during the pre-token sale. Uh, so, we're expecting to be able to announce that the smart contract will be uh, the audit, the result of the audits, and the actual contract itself will be viewable in the next two to three weeks. Uh, but um, uh, we have a min cap of uh, 15 million, um, and that's reflected of uh, a certain number of tokens that uh, need to be sold in order for uh, us to be able to launch um, in exactly the way we've budgeted uh, our platform. Um, and so if that min cap is not reached, um, built right into the smart contract itself is the uh, ability for uh, our smart contract to send back uh, the investment to all the participants. Um, so obviously if we reach 14 and a half million, I'm hoping someone in the audience will, you know, cover us for a half a million. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, um, you know, we wanted to offer that uh, as a way to protect uh, smaller investors. Um, and really, you know, the small investors are what's key to our success. Uh, we, you know, um, want to have uh, a large community, a large global community of participants and investors in our platform. Um, and, you know, uh, so that's, I guess, the, the largest risk, which, you know, I believe we've mitigated. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing to just share that I hope is not lost on anyone that's uh, participating today, um, you know, the folks that are going to benefit from the solutions that we've developed right, um, are not going to care that it's blockchain based. They're not going to care that there's a token behind it. Um, we have very smartly looked within the telecommunications industry and looked to address pain points that exist today. So, um, you know, we went into great technical detail about BAT and BDWAN, um, 
but from a very kind of you know end user marketing perspective you know these products solve immediate problems that exist today um, and so I know for example within the financial community the folks that are going to adapt BD WAN or adapt BAT they're incentivized to do it because we're providing for example more efficient you know services uh, immediate cost benefits and so uh, we're very pleased and excited that you know the folks that we talk to are ready to be signed up we've got LOIs from very large customers uh, we've got lots of um, uh, telco partnerships uh, in, in various stages and uh, as a result you know I feel very confident that um, what we're developing what we've built and our delivery of it uh, will be executed flawlessly um, and you know we have a few more surprises uh, that we'll be sharing to our community uh, around what we're going to be accomplishing and doing um, and uh, in either case, uh, my point is that uh, we are on track to be very successful. Um, and for those that um, have the pleasure of investing, there's absolutely you know, high growth potential here. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And uh, uh, let's see if we can get uh, some more questions as well. Okay, while we're gathering for... Hold on. Uh, going back to the WXLAN, uh, what is this cost savings of any using that technology? And uh, can the consumer benefit from using this at all? Yeah. Uh, Mustafa, if you want to uh, perhaps uh, speak here and uh, give my voice a little bit of a break. Uh, let's talk about, uh, I guess, VXLAN and how it benefits. VX the yeah. So, yes. So, VXLAN is the, uh, like, evolution over VLAN. It adds more, like, uh, layer two subnets and layer two segments in the uh, switch or layer two environment. And regarding the cost saving for that solution, uh, yes. So, because, as we discussed, we will be offering both kind of solutions, software only, as well as hardware and software, you know? So people can like download the software piece over their regular networking gear. We will be like um, uh, updating the uh, like compatibility list of all networking gear that can accommodate our OpenCT blockchain uh, like component, software component, along with the BAT technology. And they can have that installed, running properly, and that's it, you know? So it will be a very, very cost-effective solution for them. For others who are looking to, like, um, connect their data centers, maybe in a DCI data center interconnect environment, or maybe their offices, or the enterprises, branches, you know, even service providers in order to like uh, uh, connect uh, their uh, locations, geographically dispersed locations, they can make use of the bet because it again leverages the public internet, which is very like cheap or less expensive option than any other kind of dedicated circuits or MPLS over the dedicated circuits or any kind of tunneling like IPsec, GRE and all other kind of like uh, enterprise VPN solutions, you know? So yes, there is some kind of cost effectively. Can I, can I take a moment, Mustafa, uh, to answer uh, the exact, uh, in a slightly different way uh, by giving some real world uh, applications in terms of folks that we're even talking to. So without revealing, you know, uh, sensitive information, uh, we're in talks with, um, uh, let's just say, one of the largest um, uh, trading services firms that uh, specializes in providing uh, real-time uh, market data information to their clients. Okay, I'm sure folks might be able to guess who we're talking about. Uh, but, you know, to date, um, in order to send that market data information, um, they very expensively need to use dedicated circuits. Um, and those dedicated circuits are expensive, right? But uh, because the market data information that they disseminate is um, sent via multicast, 
and because today um, uh, it is impossible to uh, securely and to efficiently uh, disseminate multicast, multicast data via the public internet, um, this is why they pay for very expensive private circuits. With our BAT solution, um, we're actually able to allow this uh, large enterprise to disseminate this data using highly secured public internet connections. So they're ecstatic about what we're doing because they recognize that instead of having you know, dedicated T1s or uh, even larger uh, pipes, uh, they can uh, very securely use uh, public internet connections um, and they can uh, disseminate this market data, this multicast market data. Um, you know, there's other ways in which uh, uh, BAT is uh, of benefit. Um, certainly the fact that it's uh, uh, allowing um, uh, the data center to expand beyond, you know, uh, a two, you know, an A and B point, uh, you know, one network. Uh, we can, you know, very efficiently uh, provision data uh, across multiple uh, networks or across the internet itself. Um, obviously, uh, when you look at BAT in comparison to BDWAN, um, there are some specific uh, areas where BAT uh, excels. Uh, but of course, you know, BDWAN is probably the uh, uh, Bentley of uh, uh, circuit uh, solutions in the sense that uh, it encompasses uh, more traditional uh, private uh, optical-based circuits. Um, and, you know, one thing that I hope wasn't missed in the audience is that with BDWAN, there's also the, you know, software-defined networking component where we have the ability to turn up and turn down, you know, optical-based circuits uh, very efficiently uh, and with provisioning time that just doesn't exist today. Um, I hope that uh, answered uh, your question. And uh, let's see if we can take a few more questions. And we've got quite a few on the uh, webinar that I'd like to share. So um, I'll pause and ask if there's more uh, questions from the audience. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, we're here to uh, answer a lot. And in fact, uh, just as a scheduling note, um, we're probably just uh, for the benefit of uh, all who are you know, there and uh, uh, we, we, we're gonna probably have a closing statement not long from now. Um, and then we're gonna be available to answer any questions for folks that have questions uh, uh, even longer. So I'll pause and ask if uh, uh, there's uh, more questions from uh, the live audience. And if not, I'll, I'll share some of the questions from the webinar. So Sorry. anybody yeah. that registered coming into the building, we're going to have that information and instructions will be mailed to you on how to claim those tokens. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, and for those on the webinar, uh, we have, uh, we're tracking everyone that's logged in and uh, uh, we'll do the same on that side. Hey, me, Andy, we have no more questions here. So you go on to the webinar questions. Okay, let's just share a few of them. Um, let's see, uh, there was a question about whether or not the uh, uh, presentation would be made available. Yes, uh, everyone who's joined us today uh, will receive a, uh, an email with the um, uh, presentation, the recorded presentation. Um, do, 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 do. And there's definitely opportunity for more uh, even sort of private Q&A sessions. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, as I stated earlier, we have a Wednesday uh, 8 a.m. and 12 noon Eastern Standard Time seminar uh, that's geared a little bit more towards uh, investors uh, and business questions. Um, and then on Fridays, we have uh, 8 a.m. and 12 noon Eastern Standard Time where we focus on um, more technical questions. Um, so, question from David Morris. Is the intent uh, to use OCT as a medium of exchange between carriers to enable carrier-to-carrier SD-WAN? So, absolutely, yes. Uh, that is one of the intents, and uh, we're developing some specific applications that will support just that. 
Uh, on the other hand, BAT and BD-WAN, which we're focusing on uh, today uh, in terms of, uh, uh, these are developed with end clients, enterprise telco clients in mind. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, can you please elaborate on how you plan to convert fiat to crypto, uh, your token, a decentralized exchange type service? Uh, yep, one option is us building our own decentralized exchange. Uh, but till that time, our token will be traded as any other coin token over uh, the different crypto exchanges, especially the big ones. Um, okay. So uh, I think there may be some more questions. And uh, my apologies if I didn't get to all of them. Uh, but we are definitely uh, going to review and make sure... Um, Let's see, hold on, this is from uh, Mr. Morris. Um, aside from some of the applications, what makes OTC unique to telecom? Why couldn't these applications be delivered with existing currencies? Okay, speed and power requirements are key parts. Traditional, traditional cryptocurrency technologies can only perform three to 15 transactions per second. Uh, for telco applications, we need tens of thousands of transactions per second. That was actually yeah. my answer. Yeah, I see that. Got it. You know what? But it, it's a good point, and I'd like to just share this uh, a little bit before uh, I turn it over to Peru for uh, closing. Uh, so, you know, uh, for folks that uh, are not as familiar with what's happening in uh, blockchain, you know, there's a lot of uh, excitement about Ethereum these days. And, and in fact, we're using the Ethereum platform for our crowd sale. Uh, we have uh, an ERC20 token. But the ultimate platform with which our utility-based token is going to be uh, used um, is highly inspired by something called Graphene. Uh, and for folks that are familiar with Graphene, you may know that it's used for uh, Steemit. Uh, it's the basis for the amazing EOS. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're using something that's very similar to Graphene. And, and let me just talk about that for a second. So, you know, Bitcoin was uh, designed to ensure that the value of uh, uh, tokens were uh, secure and stored, um, but it's a very uh, behemoth of a uh, platform and in fact uh, can only support um, I think three to seven transactions per second. Um, Ethereum itself can support close to 15 transactions per second, but if you could imagine in, in the telco space, you know, we're talking about lots and lots of transactions, lots of data that happens very, very quickly. Um, uh, so our platform, in fact, is going to be supporting, uh, much like Graphene, uh, more in the neighborhood of 100,000 transactions per second. And for folks who may be scratching their head about those numbers, uh, TPS is what it's called, um, just by way of comparison, uh, the Visa credit card network, for example, globally, where you know, people are constantly using their Visa credit card, uh, supports about 60,000 transactions per second. So um, you know, we're talking a much higher magnitude. Uh, and so for the person who asked about why couldn't other, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies be used, uh, that's uh, a good explanation. Uh, but I also want to state that, you know, the emphasis on what makes our products unique for telco has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. Uh, as I said, uh, the people that are going to be adopting these solutions are going to be because we very smartly leveraged our experience within Telco to create solutions to immediate problems. Uh, the fact that it's blockchain based um, is great, but it isn't what's going to drive their adoption of these solutions. It's because uh, of the problems that we actually solve. Um, and before I turn it over to you, I see just two more questions. Let me see if I can get this. Um, what kind of additional upgrades are required for existing SD-WAN deployment? Okay. Uh, do you need a token for every transaction? If yes, then who pays for it and what is the cost benefit? Okay. We kind of answered these questions. Uh, so I'm going to try to just quickly summarize. Um, so obviously uh, for existing SD-WAN deployments, it's, it's hard to uh, um, provide an answer that encompasses all SD-WAN deployments. Um, our own, uh, solution is going to be our own. Um, one thing that's interesting about the way we're leveraging blockchain, though, is that for a large enterprise that may, for example, have multiple MPLS providers, 
uh, uh, we have a solution that uh, is unique and that actually ensures the ability to um, uh, leverage uh, multiple MPLS providers uh, with near zero downtime delay. So uh, without getting into the t technical aspects of it, if you are a large enterprise, global enterprise, uh, that are using uh, the MPLS servers of multiple uh, vendors, which would be a smart move to do, obviously. Um, you know, we have an ability leveraging our BD WAN to ensure that uh, interoperability between the multiple MPLS providers uh, is facilitated very smartly, very quickly, and very efficiently, and that doesn't exist today. Uh, that's something that large enterprise uh, clients uh, are challenged with. Um, and then the next question, uh, although I missed it, uh, hold on. Uh, yes, whether tokens are needed for every transaction. So just briefly, we did touch on this earlier. Yes, tokens are needed for every transaction, uh, but the way that it is actually facilitated is kind of in the background, behind the scenes. So uh, no end client, for example, is ever going to be panicking because they their token supply is low and they need to buy more tokens in order to, you know, have more emails or, you know, data transitions. Um, that's all behind the scenes. Uh, and we very smartly ensured that, you know, end clients um, will simply have the benefit of a lower cost, more efficient solution uh, and a bill that they pay like they normally do. Uh, so I hope that kind of answers that question. Um, I'm going to turn over to you, Peru. Uh, and John, uh, can we uh, begin with the uh, closing comments? Yes, thank you. You know, there's one statement that I want to make clear that uh, you mentioned before about uh, 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 tokens and cryptocurrency. And there's something that, that everyone should be aware of. A year ago, a year ago, January of uh, 2017, cryptocurrency market was at $17 billion. A year and two months ago, I'm sorry, or really beginning of th three months. And today, uh, cryptocurrency has reached $400 billion. I'm talking about the, the cryptocurrency market cap. Imagine what's going to be next year. So our application, you know, either though I do agree with what Mandy said about we can support fiat, but it's, it's ready for the cryptocurrency uh, 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 digital currency payments, which is instantaneous, transparently, and happens right away. Now, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, realize this, but cryptocurrency, or should I say digital currency uh, in China, for example, 90% of all transactions, financial transactions, are done by uh, digital currency. You know, the, the guys who, who, who beg for coins, they have a QR code, literally. You know, they're not, not a hat. It's amazing. So, and that market is coming here in a big way. In fact, you know, uh, this is a true story. I was here about a week ago, and I went to, and I was leaving, and I was going to this, uh, on 6th Avenue, there was this little restaurant there, and it was packed full of young people, and it looked pretty good, because I see our restaurant, young people, I'm in. And I walked in there, and there was, there was a line, I ordered, and, and, they said it was $26, I take, out my I take out cash, and they say to me, oh no, we don't take cash, which was amazing. And I took a credit card out, and they said, oh no, we don't take credit card, we have our own uh, unique uh, uh, software we have to download, you know? And, and we have a, a QR code, but you have to download our software. Uh, the place was called Coe, Pedro, what was the name? Coe's, I think it was called Coe's. But anyway, it was just amazing to me, and as I'm leaving, I felt, I felt horrible carrying cash, especially the young people were literally laughing at me, you know? And this is where we're going. This is the, this is the evolution that we're, we're at. Tomorrow's technology is here today. And to be honest with you, we're just catching up. And blockchain technology is tomorrow's technology, which is here today. So on that note, <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for your time, spending your Friday night with us, and, and take care, guys. See you there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it.